Hey guys, Mike here. Welcome back to another video on the channel. Back in the workshop with the Cherokee, but not for eight months this time. I've just been rebuilding some injectors, putting new nozzles on. Not bigger nozzles, but just the same nozzle I had before, but new. Had some leaking injectors, some dripping ones, so hopefully that should sort that out. But um, in this video, I thought I'd talk about how to get more power from your 2.5 turbo diesel XJ. I mean, it really can apply to most um, older diesel engines, you know, that the same rules, the same laws apply, but it's obviously going to be a lot harder on more modern electronically controlled vehicles. Um, but uh, if you've bought a 2.5 turbo diesel XJ and you're looking for more power, maybe this video can help you out. I've had a lot of questions on Instagram and uh, that's kind of what inspired me to do this video. First off, I'm no expert. Um, and there are a lot of people out there that I communicate with and I learn from and that send me messages and ideas and advice So, you know, thanks to those people, but um, you know, I thought I'd share my experiences anyway with with the work I've done on my engine and the trial and error I've gone through to get to where it is now if you look at it It's obviously not very standard anymore. You have a different turbo different intake manifold different exhaust manifold different exhaust different intake uh, You've got a slightly different fuel pump now you know, everything's kind of been modified and, and it's kind of been brought back a bit into into sort of more of a more mechanically tunable engine to um, to take away those electronic dependencies and allow me to sort of muck around with it and get the performance I'm looking for. Um, you know, it's a pretty heavy vehicle now, just under sort of 2.2 tonnes really with it fully loaded. Um, you know, bigger tyres, got 35s, 488 gears. Obviously, you'd expect some performance loss there, but obviously the gearing, you know, makes that that kind of a lot better. Obviously, fuel economy is around 30 miles per gallon. We just did our summer trip, and I think I did around 650 kilometers, and I used a full tank of fuel, around 72 liters. So that is pretty good. I think that's around one in 11, or maybe a little bit more. I'm not sure. So, you know, it's a it's kind of all around a very well balanced vehicle now with power economy and um, you know an off-road performance and uh, you know I'm sort of where I want to be with it but um, before I get into the specifics of kind of what I've done I thought I'd touch on what you can do if you're looking to get more power from your diesel XJ and first of all you really need to decide whether it's a road you want to go down or a rabbit hole you want to you want to trip fall into um, because before you get into spending loads of money on the engine, it's best to sort of decide whether you're gonna to wanna to do it. I mean, I kind of enjoy polishing turds, so whether it's this vehicle or it's a Bajero or whatever, whatever else I could own, I'd probably be doing the same thing to it anyway. You know, it's a project vehicle, and for me, I don't really look at the money, I look at the, the, um, the achievement I get from, from the work I'm doing and, and the enjoyment of problem solving and everything else. So for me, the worst thing in the world would be to buy a vehicle off the shelf that didn't need any work doing to it. Um, you yeah, know, that, that would be very boring and my winters would be very boring. So that's only something you can really decide and, and something you can, you know, basically figure out for yourself. But by far the best thing to do straight off the bat is check the current health status of the engine you've got. Um, maybe a compression test would be the first port of call. So, you know, you can buy those kits online or borrow them. If you're only ever going to do it once, I'd borrow it. But if you're going to be, you know, an amateur mechanic like me doing this kind of stuff year in, year out um, and using the vehicle a lot, you know, it's worth buying a kit because you're probably going to use it, you know, maybe on a yearly or, or two year yearly basis. Um, but you can test the compression of the cylinders and the engine manual states somewhere around 24 to 26 bar, uh, which I think is around 370 something PSI um, at crank. So obviously you're probably gonna have a bit more compression than that when the engine warms up, but if you're running somewhere around there, then you know, you, you know you're, you've got good compression across all four cylinders and you've got a good starting point. If you're way below that, then obviously the engine either needs a full rebuild which is something I would tackle first if you really on to intend on keeping the engine. Or maybe first off the bat, I would try an engine additive, something like AimTech Engine Restore is a product I use quite a bit. In fact, I use it with every oil change. I'm not affiliated with them, by the way, 
but it is a good product. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail of how it works. So that would be my first point, um, you know, that I would check. Um, another thing would probably be um, to do something like checking, you know, the air filter, you know, make sure you change your air filter. Don't bother with one of these cold air intakes. The standard air box on this 2.5 turbo diesel is absolutely adequate. You can see I don't have one anymore, but that's because I've changed my intercooler. You know, there's no room anymore for it. If there was, I would absolutely definitely keep it. And it makes getting replacement air filters much easier. You can always go with like a K&N or something, you know, the same dimension filter for it. But yeah, I mean, you know, just, just you can try it, see whether it, it helps you out. You won't notice any performance, I promise you that. Another thing would be to do what I've just done and rebuild injectors. It's not expensive to do, nor is it difficult. And if you have dripping injectors, um, you know, they're eventually going to burn a hole through the piston, you know, and it's going to, and it's going to cause some problems. So it's definitely worth doing that. You can see that I have a different intercooler setup on my XJ. So I've moved my intercooler um, from just behind the rear cross member where it originally is to just behind the grill there. But one thing you want, you, you could do is at least take off that factory intercooler and check it for the amount of crud that's inside it. You know, a lot of garbage, a lot of rubbish, a lot of shit builds up inside the intercooler. A lot of oil, for example, um, you know, when they're low down in the vehicle, like they are on the standard 2.5 turbo diesel, if you're using it for off-roading, if you're going through muddy water, for example, you know, you're, you're gonna clog up the fins on that intercooler and, and you're essentially gonna, you know, kind of limit its capability to cool down the charge air that's coming out of the turbocharger. So either relocating that with something of a similar size like I've done, or just taking it off and cleaning it and checking it, um, you know, it's, it's going to be um, a good way to see your engine's health. Because if it's full of oil, you know that um, you've got a number of problems there and it's probably related to the turbo just blowing a lot of oil past the turbo seal, or maybe the PCV, positive crank ventilation, um, so the oil separator from the bottom of the sump isn't functioning properly, and that's letting through a lot of oil vapor that's getting sucked through the turbo. So that's something else you can take off as a little plastic can, um, the oil separator, see, just give it a clean, see whether the diaphragm inside it is damaged or you know it might need replacing. You can pick them up very cheap and they don't need to be specific to this vehicle. Other little things you can do are just change the fuel filter, you know, give it an oil change, maybe use an oil additive like that engine restore. I also use Micron Molly, uh, which adds a protective coating to a lot of the working parts in the engine. I use that in my transmission because I use the same motor oil in my transmission that I do in my engine. Basically, you know, there's a number of things you can do really to establish good engine health. And, you know, if you're at a point where you've got good compression, you've changed the number of the filters, you don't have excess oil in the intercooler, your injectors are working fine. You kind of know you're in a position really where you can start seeking more power from the engine and you know, you're gonna get the most out of your money. So let's start with number one. We already talked about rebuilding the injectors. You know, it's a good thing to do. Maybe increase your fuel economy. It might increase power a little bit. Another thing you can do is take a look at an intercooler. You could swap that out for a different size intercooler. I've tried a number of different setups. I've had one that has an exit on both sides, but it ended up having very long charge pipes and it gave me some nasty turbo lag that I wasn't really that keen on. Now I've gone for a same side intercooler of a pretty bit decent brand. Now there might be a lot of naysayers who say that that's a really bad idea because you're blocking a lot of the radiator. Obviously air will pass through the intercooler and go in through the radiator, through the fins, and you might sort of con concern yourself about things like heat soak. In my case, I've left about an inch gap between the radiator and the intercooler. I've actually moved my radiator back about sort of three or four centimeters to be able to do this. And it just stops them being in contact, kind of vibrating and destroying each other, but also means there's a decent air gap. You know, it, it depends on, on the climate of the country you live in. You know, where I live, it's, you know, I live in the north of Sweden. Well. South Lapland, so kind of just above the middle of Sweden. It's not that warm here. The summer, yeah, you can be around 33 to 35 degrees C, but it's not gonna be like that for the majority of the year. So I'm not massively worried about temperatures here, but you know, if you're living in Australia or something or parts of the US, you know, really hot climate, I don't know, 
and you, and you happen to come across one of these diesels, then you know I, I'd be careful, you know, and just see how these temperatures go in terms of the water temperatures. Perhaps you can change your turbo piping, changing your intercooler piping from rubber piping to aluminium piping or stainless steel piping or even silicon piping is a good thing to do. Silicon piping is good because it is a little bit stiffer than the standard rubber you get with the engine. Um, it's less susceptible to rotting with the oil. And um, you know, when you have that standard rubber piping and you get all that boost coming out of the turbo, you will see that rubber expand. I guess it's not a loss of pressure technically, but it is adding a little bit of turbo lag and a little bit of response that you might get off the bat. And if you're hunting for performance and you're being real nitpicky about it, it is something you might want to address. And you can buy an aluminium intercooler piping kit with couplings, which I will add isn't the best thing you can do because the couplings are always a potential area for loss of pressure and, and, and failure. But you know, if you're an amateur like me and you can't afford to get someone to TIG weld some stainless thing up for you or build some, something out of aluminium, you can put in one of those kits and you will see performance gains. You know, you will see that. And it will also eliminate potential failures on the road, you know, punctures and such and deterioration of the piping. And it will mean that that pressure goes straight through those pipes and it doesn't cause them to expand. You know, and, and you've essentially eliminated a potential lag point there in that boost, you know, giving you that power on demand a little bit quicker. Another thing you can do is, is, is change your exhaust. I mean, you know, the exhaust is often overlooked, but it's actually quite an essential part of, of, the, of the respiratory system of the engine, let's say. But if you look at my, my exhaust, I have a two and a half inch downpipe coming off the back of the turbo into a very short two and a half inch stainless exhaust with a slightly larger opening at the back, mainly for noise and to make it sound good, you know, to give it a real grunt. But um, you don't necessarily need to do that. But you know, there's no catalytic converter or anything like that or restrictions in the exhaust. Everything can just get dumped straight out. And when that Garrett GT2052 is spooling real fast and I'm putting my foot down and building a lot of boost, I know that that, that air can, can move through the system very freely. And um, you, know, it, it's, you know, it's a good thing to have. But a lot of these things are, are small things actually um, in terms of performance gains, I think for this engine, you're not gonna see massive performance gains by doing this stuff. It's good stuff to do, and um, it all helps um, the end result. You know, all these things support each other. I guess it depends what kind of engine you've got. Do you have the Mark I engine? Do you have the Mark II engine uh, with the electronic fuel pump? It, it depends. I mean, I've got a turbo just here next to me. If I just grab this, and, and this is off the Mark I engine, and um, I've written on the tur what, what turbo it is. This is VA180089, I think that says, but I'll put it in the description below. And this comes off of the Mark I engine, and I installed this into my Mark II engine, and it increased the performance of the engine significantly. This, this is a really good turbo to strap on that particular engine because obviously it goes straight on. This is from that engine. Um, you know, you've got the three bolt there. It goes directly on the manifold. And, and if you're lucky and you do get it off of a Mark I engine, you get the, the solid cast one piece downpipe instead of that horrible um, downpipe you get on the Mark II, which is this flange. And then just they've just welded on like a one mil thick downpipe coming out the back of it. And it, and it is actually quite restricted in a way. This will hold the heat a lot better, and holding heat is all a part of the equation. Hot air travels faster, and that's what you want for the turbo to spin faster and generate more boost quicker. But this particular turbo wastegate from stock is 26.7 PSI. You're never really going to get that high in making it generate that kind of boost unless you're revving the tits out of this thing at 4000 RPM in the snow, like I did sometimes, and then you will see around about 22 to 25 PSI. But um, the reality is that, that this generates more boost than the turbo that was in this engine before, and it gave me a noticeable power increase, a significant power increase, and it's also much louder, which is cool. You know, you want it to sort of make a bit of a whistle and make some noise. But um, that's an easy mod you can do. So, um, you know, you will see noticeable power increases with the turbo, but, um, you know, one, one thing I will say about the turbo is that you're not just going to see suddenly loads of power putting a, putting a turbo on that can push more charge air into the engine. 
So the air you push in can only make power with regards to how much fuel you're putting in. So if I put 100 PSI into my engine, I'm going to get no more power than I already have with a maximum of 22 PSI. You know, because the amount of fuel I'm putting in isn't enough to make 100 PSI actually do anything. Obviously the engine would explode with 100 PSI, but I'm talking kind of hypothetically. So, you know, don't just think chucking tons of boost into your engine is going to give you tons of power. Now, my engine used to pump out tons of black smoke on the old turbo when I used to go out off-roading. It was always spewing out black smoke. And when I put that turbo on, it was burning a lot cleaner and I had a lot more power. So instantly that tells me that, you know, obviously that black smoke is unburnt fuel. That tells me that, that, that I'm now putting in, or I'm getting better atomization of the fuel in the combustion chamber, therefore generating more power. Uh, probably not a lot more, you know, maybe around 20 horsepower, maybe, maybe just 10, I don't know, I don't have a dyno. But I could feel a significant change in power. Would I say it was an upgrade worth doing? I think if you can get the turbo for cheap, I'd do it. But to be honest with you, if you really want to go down another road of getting more power, I would probably look at an aftermarket turbo and either find a new exhaust manifold, build a new exhaust manifold adapter to go on the end of the manifold and relocate the turbo so it's not tucked down the side of the engine. So if it does fail, you've got to pull the whole engine apart to get it out. In my case, I relocated mine with a Chrysler Voyager manifold and a Ford Scorpio intake manifold to free up room for the extension on the end of the exhaust manifold so I could push my turbo forward and um, when I need to change it, I know it's going to be a piece of cake. And I went with a Garrett because it's a really well suited turbo for this engine, that Garrett GT2052. I mean, I've got it coming in at 1300 RPM, which is awesome. And that's thanks to someone out there, by the way, who gave me some good advice on tuning the fuel pump. So um, my, my fuel response to the to boost pressure is really nice now. So it's coming in nice and early, but it really just means that, that I can order that turbo anywhere in Europe and it'll be on my doorstep within a week. You know, so if it does break down, I don't have to find this original part or get it repaired. And that turbo is cheaper than this turbo. Something that a lot, a lot of people do to gain more power out of the engine is they advance the pump timing. Because what you're doing is, is you're injecting the fuel into the cylinder a bit earlier. And, um, and, that, and that's basically gonna, gonna burn all of that fuel you're gonna get worse emissions, obviously, and that's probably why they put these electronic systems in. And sometimes it means that the engine vibrates horribly, like rattles, like I was chatting to a guy out there, I actually commented on the other video, and he said that he, he tried it, and um, you know, it basically caused the engine to sort of vibrate to a point where it just didn't sound good at all. So he backed it off again. Um, really, really, the thing to establish is, is you're only ever going to be able to get so much power from this engine. You know, it, it, it is a low horsepower, low torque engine. I think off the bat, this thing does around 116 horsepower and about 300 Newton meters of torque, maybe just a little bit more than that in terms of torque. But you know, that's, that's the thing about these diesel engines. They're low down, low RPM grunty engines. And that's kind of why they serve their purpose so well in an agricultural setting, because they, they, they work very hard. You know, let's say in, in low RPM situations where you've got, you know, 2000 RPM, you're in second gear, you're in low range, you know, the turbo's going, everything feels right. That engine can pull all day long like that, and it will never overheat. The time when these engines start to falter is when you're going at highway speeds in fifth gear, it's a hot day, You've got a lot of gear on board like I've got and you go into a gradual hill climb and those exhaust gas temperatures will start to go up and up and up and up and up and up and you might unknowingly because you don't have an EGT gauge or a boost gauge be like Ugh, the engine doesn't feel like it's got enough power at all this thing's junk you know and you put your foot down again you start pushing and pushing and pushing but little do you know those temperatures from the those, those exhaust gas temperatures have gone way above what they should be. So let's say they've gone way above 650 degrees C, which is which is very high. And, and you're kind of putting your engine then in a situation where 
you're putting it in a very uncomfortable situation. You're taking it to its uppermost comfort point. And, and, and what will determine whether it will survive or not is how long it remains at that point for. If you're doing a very long, te like sort of laborious hill climb, fully decked out like that in fifth, and you're pushing it on a very hot day for let's say half an hour, you might run into engine failure. You might find that you, you, you either blow a head gasket, some, a valve fails or collapses inside the cylinder head. You might end up with a cracked head. That's one thing about this particular engine is it's a very well re robust agricultural engine, but the cylinder head design is inherently flawed. I don't like the original cylinder heads. I speak to some guys who really do, but personally, I think the AMC heads are better from what I've tested over the years. I've done one of these and I very hard. And the results for me are but you know, you, you potentially might get in a, to a situation where you damage the engine. So how much power you can get out of this engine um, is really limited, uh, to be honest with you. It's got cast alloy pistons, basically. So when you're looking at that already, there's, there's gonna be an upper temperature limit that they're gonna be able to handle before they melt. You, you're gonna have to keep an eye on your EGTs and you really do need a pyro gauge and you need to, to drill and tap that exhaust manifold and you need to have that pyro gauge all the way back as close to the exit port of, of the exhaust exit port on the cylinder head on cylinder number four as you possibly can because the EGT is only an indicator it's not telling you what's going on inside the combustion chamber I had 650 on that EGT gauge but but maybe maybe I was at 750 or maybe more inside the cylinder. So you know, how long can that piston operate at that temperature for? I mean, it has a few things going for it and there's a lot of other factors that come into play. For example, it's being cooled by oil. It's not actually also directly touching the explosion, hopefully. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, the explosion's happening and, and it's recoiling away very quickly. And then cool air is then being fired in by the turbo, lots of charge air, which, which in my case is quite a bit, and, and that's obviously a good thing too. So that's cooling it down as well. And you also have to remember aluminium disperses heat very quickly into the oil, into the cylinder, into the surrounding structure and material around it. So, you know, there are many other factors at play and, and, and you know, a destruction test of the engine isn't something I'm prepared to do. Maybe I'll do it on my spare one day if I get it running. But, you know, a safe thing is not to go above 650. So, so you can get more power out of the engine, but I wouldn't say you could get much out of it. And, and maybe if you go crazy and you can start playing around with other things like water injection, then you're just going, you're, 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 you've gone into a whole new realm of turd polishing beyond anything I could ever imagine. And, and I don't know why you do that with this engine, because it's not worth it unless you're an idiot like me. And then turd polishing is, is all you do. So, you know, I've done a lot of talking here um, and I hopefully have showed a lot of photos and video to make it more interesting so you're not just looking at me chat shit the whole time. But if there are people out there who are interested in, um, in doing this, I'd write something in the comments section. And if there are people out there who have done all of this, then, you know, comment. I mean, I spoke to a gentleman the other day who had a similar engine, the 3.1 diesel, and, and he said he had 250 horsepower out of it. I'm not entirely sure how that's possible, but um, if you have achieved that, then, you know, you, you, you need to share it with other people. Um, basically, uh, I mean, yeah, it, I, th I think if you want it to get to power levels like that with an engine like this, you, you need and you have to change the material of the pistons themselves to, to steel or, or iron or whatever else they use, cast iron, um, which can handle significantly more temperature, higher temperatures, but will give you more lag in acceleration. Um, and also, is the cylinder head itself going to be able to cope with much more? I don't think so. So, um, 
you know, looking at my engine, let's take a look at it first. I'll, I'll just give you a short, short tour. So this is a little bird's eye view shot of the engine. I'll just walk you through some stuff I've done. Um, you can obviously see some obvious changes compared to the other engine I've got over there, which is what it used to look like in terms of the configuration and the manifolds and all that. So, you know, to, to, fr to make room for this fabrication here, um, I had to get this off a, a Ford Scorpio, this intake manifold. So, so the old one would have the, the intake port there, which would mean that I couldn't have this. So I managed to find this off the Ford Scorpio. It's a direct fit because obviously it's exactly the same engine, but just configured in the engine bay differently. But you can get this same manifold off of the ZJ 2.5 turbo diesel engine. Um, and um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really nice manifold. The exhaust manifold's off a Chrysler Voyager, and that came with the T25 or T28 um, turbo flange on it, which just made things a little bit easier. Originally, the turbo was meant to be just here without this extra piping I had to make. So, um, but, but obviously mine being a right-hand drive, the brake booster's right there, um, whether it be on the other side on a left-hand drive. So on a left-hand drive, you've actually got room to, to do that um, and not have all of this piping nonsense all over the place. But um, on the right-hand drive, it needs to be forward of that. And then you have to fabricate a new downpipe that goes down there. And, and there's actually plenty of room for that. But um, this is a stainless piece of pipe, basically, with T2 adapters on it. I did that because um, it means I can just choose any turbo I want. But this Garrett GT2052, I think it's an excellent choice for this particular small engine. It's You know, what you're looking for is a low-down torque. You know, you're looking for... For boost, in my case, coming in around 1,300 RPM up to about 3,000 RPM, um, but but really starting to teeter off in terms of peak performance at around 2,500 RPM. But I really very rarely ever take the engine above that because um, I just don't really feel like I or fit doesn't really feel like I need to. Um, so that's got a two and a half to a three inch um, tube there, no MAF sensor because obviously it, it doesn't use a MAF sensor anymore. Um, instead of a MAF sensor, I've actually got a, um, a pipe here. You see this coming round, and that goes into the top of the semi-mechanical fuel pump, which sort of operates a diaphragm with a fuel pin on it. And I've tuned that so that I get a lot more fuel down in low RPM ranges. So that's how that turbo is coming in really early on that. And, and that was something I wasn't aware of actually until someone pointed it out. Um, helped me on Instagram the other day, so, so thanks for that. I, I can't remember the chap's name, but I'm, I'm sure he knows who he is, and I appreciate the tip because it's massively improved the, the sort of takeoff performance and the power build up there. So um, that that's really good. So one subject I really haven't covered in this video with regards to getting more power out of the engine is more fuel. Um, you know, I may have talked about tuning the pump and stuff, but that, that's probably more along the lines of fuel response, you know, in terms of the, the, the turbo and the pump working together for the best results. But um, with regards to like fuel pressure and the volume of fuel in the injector and the injector nozzle and all of that kind of stuff, I haven't really gone into that. Um, you know, that is really the, the, the main way of making a lot more power out of the engine more fuel basically means more power and then you balance that out with more boost and you know you, you get that that kind of uh, that mixture right and, and everything's going to work for you but um i haven't done that with regards to the mods i've done everything i've shown you that, that i've done it's sort of like um kind of capitalizing on power that the engine is already capable of that the infrastructure already supports um, you know, it's power that's sort of already there, basically. Um, I don't see any reason why this engine isn't capable of around 150 to 160 horsepower, um, which I think is a respectable number, really, for, for a small diesel engine like this. I, I, there's a chap online um, who I've seen who's got around 160 out of it, and, um, you know, he's done much of the similar mods that I've done. I don't believe he's using more fuel, but I, it's hard to tell sometimes because, um, you know, the languages don't always translate so well. But, um, you know, I don't know what my engine's putting out. I would quite put, happily put 150 on it. I, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to run it on a dyno to really be sure. But um, it's running 
a lot more power than it used to when I first bought it and the vehicle's a lot heavier yeah it feels a lot lighter um, I'm sure there are other factors at play there like the gears and everything else but um, you know I'm, I'm very happy with it anyway and I'm not going to go down the route of, of changing injectors and more fuel because I just think that 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 this particular engine pro probably is the wrong engine for that job you know I don't think you can squeeze that much more out of it really um, you know in terms of of the combustion temperatures the cylinder head design everything else I think you, you might run into problems but there may be guys out there who, who are already doing that who can quite happily correct me in the comments section you know it's one of those subjects I'd be quite happy to be wrong on I would love to to know more about that and squeeze more power out of it safely if I could I don't think I could really if I'm being honest and I'm looking at kind of like the diagnostic tools like the EGT gauge and everything else it just just feels to me like really it is where it is and, and trying to get too much out of it is, is going to be you know going to be problems down the line but I hope you've enjoyed this video I hope it's given some ideas I really wanted to make this vid because of all the questions I've been asked about what I've done to the engine hopefully this has answered it there's a load of links in the description to the components I've used and, and you know, it is expensive to do all this. You know, you have to want to do it. You have to enjoy it. It has to be a hobby. Sometimes it's not about getting anything back from it financially. It's just about enjoying your life and, and doing something that interests you in my case. But, you know, you, you have to weigh that up yourself. So um, thanks for watching. Got any comments, leave them below. Um, and uh, I'll see you very soon in another video. Take care.